All right. The magic word is Noah Gibson, okay? Managing attorney, Coates, Fry, Tanamoto, and Gibson. Welcome to the show, Noah. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> good to be here. All right. Yeah, yeah appreciate have a good it. Time. So we're talking about domestic violence. Why are we talking about domestic violence? Because just a week ago, uh, Trump's uh, nominee, I don't know why he didn't catch this when he was vetting the guy, Patrick Shanahan, for the Secretary of Defense, had to withdraw. And it was really, there was an irony there, because he said he withdrew because if he had to go through the confirmation pro process, the world would find out that he had been involved in multiple, uh, you know, episodes of, of domestic violence. Oh, gee whiz. Now they found out in advance. Nobody had to ask him a single question. <laughs> I, I do not understand how that works. There has to be another a, a backstory on that, don't you think? One would imagine, um, you know, the domestic violence aspect is something that rightfully or wrongfully and, and probably appropriately has gained a lot of attention with President Trump. Um, is that like rape? And for example, in the dressing room at Bergdorf uh, Goodman, is that like uh, rape? No, it, 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 rape could be a form of domestic violence, but... Frankly, the term itself. I thought you could never rape your wife because she was your wife. You could take your Isn't this something out of the 12th century? Actually, Trump is out of the 12th century. But <laughs> isn't it true? It's a bit of a you... Neanderthal if you want to go further <laughs> okay, back. There yeah. it is. Okay. You could never rape your wife because she was your wife, and you had this like medieval right to take her. Uh, Droit de seigneur, you had the right to take her. Therefore, it could not be raped. Well, um, despite what seems to be the attempt to strip women of rights that they've had for a long time with Roe versus Wade getting uh, peeled back right now, no, that's not necessarily the case. There still has to be consent. So um, God forbid that a woman have a right to decide whether or not she have a child and whether or not she have sex with her husband, both of which are well within her rights to decide uh, both of those. But um, no, I mean, uh, sex by any sort of force or coercion is rape. Um, and the, the status of the relationship, frankly, has very little to do. Now, certainly I was, would imagine it would be a defense if it were ever to go to trial, that that would be something that was less likely than not, given the nature of the relationship. But very subjective sometimes. Consent is subjective sometimes. Sure. But with, your, with regards to get back to your question about domestic violence, um, domestic violence definition actually is, is a lot broader than just I think it's commonly thought of as male, female, romantic couples, but the definition is actually, so if you look in our penal code, um, the Hawaii Revised Statute is abuse of a household or family member. So let's say you and I were roommates in college, and we got into a fight. That could potentially be an abuse of a household family member because you and I were roommates. So it doesn't have to be limited to, um, well, abuse of a household family member doesn't have to be limited to um, anybody who has a intimate relationship or, or in a romantic relationship. Or married. Or you married. You can be buddies living together. You could be roommates. You yeah. could be mother and daughter. Yeah. You could be, as in the case of Patrick Shanahan, mother and son. Yeah. So that is domestic violence. So in Hawaii, <clears throat> one of the ways that we deal with it in, in our practice a lot is with uh, restraining orders. So one of the ways you can kind of get some distinction there is Family court deals with any protective orders having to do with household or family members. You go to family court, whether you're a roommate, whether you're a mother to son, um, that is in family court. If you don't meet one of those definitions of household or family member, you go to district court and you get an injunction against harassment. So, and the difference is one's to protect against harassment in district court, in family court, you're there to prevent domestic violence. And so one of the things I just brought along with me is the Hoyt Divorce Manual. Did you need a, 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 a cart of some kind to carry that thing around? Yeah. That's your, fa that's your, your firm's uh, book, isn't it? Coates, Fry, Tanamoto, and Gibson. Well, that's, it, that's all the jewels are in there. This is largely the Bible of the family court. So, um, you know, Brad likes to say he wrote the book on divorce. Uh, and he, he did. He wrote Divorce with Decency. But this, this, is, la livre. this is a little, little bit different. Little yeah. um, but, you know, domestic violence, there's the physical part of domestic violence. But I would say the more pervasive, the, the more silent 
and less obvious and, and probably what I think we all sort of feel but haven't put a word to, which is what we see Trump doing, at least in my opinion, is more of the power and control dynamics that yeah. morphs into um, DV or domestic violence. So, you know, I have a trial right now that I'm sitting in that the opposing counsel is saying, well, why in the world, how can you claim domestic violence? How can you claim that he did these things? You stayed in this relationship with them. Ipso facto, if you stayed in the relationship, there is no way that there could be domestic violence. It was the culture of the marriage. Well, we beat each other up because that was our way of expressing love. So send, send the other guy to the hospital and, and, uh, and, 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 that, and, and, and he or she will understand how much you love her. Well, sort of. I, I was sort of going a different, a little bit different direction. <laughs> that would be totally, um, that would be an interesting relationship. But I could no, be a great expert witness. Yeah, you could be a great expert witness. <laughs> Certainly one with opinions would be fabulous. Um, no, but the, the power and control dynamic is more so, I think, kind of what you see with the, the Patrick Shanahan thing, which is domestic violence continues and is perpetrated and it is cultivated because of his power and control over his family, right? I am the powerful secretary of defense or soon to be secretary of defense. And that power gives him control and that power and control allows the abuse to get swept under the rug or for it to continue. Um, financial is a big part of it. Emotional power and control is another part of it. Um, you know, so do you use the power and the control in a relationship to perpetuate the domestic violence and create a situation. It contaminates the whole relationship. Well, and then it creates a situation where the victim is less likely to leave the relationship. And, you know, that's more so what I was getting at is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not fair to tell the victim, well, it was your fault for staying in the relationship. If it was so bad, you would have left. Why in the world would anybody stay in a relationship where they're being abused? Well, we all, we know, and the research shows that there's a lot of good, not good reasons, but there are a lot of recognizable reasons for that, which, which come down to power and control dynamics. So it's something that the family court and our judges have been trained to look out for because those are largely factors, separating people from their families, controlling their use of credit cards or monetary things, cutting them off from their friends. Power and control, yeah. You, you create the power and control and it's, um, you know, e e those are the types of things that lend themselves to situations where domestic violence well, tends to There seems to be a line. I mean, I hope there's a line. Well, maybe it's a blurred line between, between the criminal aspect of this mm -hmm. and the family, the family law aspect of this. If I beat my wife up and put her in the hospital, um, that's a crime, isn't it? It is. So it's a family court equipped to deal with a crime and, and prosecute, essentially prosecute or cause the prosecution of a... Of, um, of a violent act that way and actually find, you know, convict somebody and put them in jail, uh, you know, uh, under, the, under the penal code? So the, the, there is a family court criminal calendar here. And um, the, the family court criminal section hears cases on abuse of household family members as well as violations of protective orders and or temporary restraining orders. So the, the answer to your question is they do. They handle both. So if that incident that you described would have taken place, that would be the basis for both a criminal charge as well as an order for protection for your wife. So the, 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 the incident occurs, there would be a criminal remedy. There would also be a basis for a protective order, which is meant and issued to uh, prevent um, future incidences, address past incidences of domestic violence and or to deal with, which we're getting better at addressing, is extreme emotional distress is another thing that family court protective orders are meant to address. You know, it's, it's not just uh, the media, uh, especially the fiction media that we see on television or hear about in the newspaper, but it's, uh, you know, practicing law. You, I don't know how you feel about this. I'd like to ask how you feel about this. So there's a temporary restraining order, some kind of show cause proceeding, I don't know what, um, against someone who has, um, who has beat up his spouse before mm -hmm. and who has been told, don't do that, don't go near her, you know, don't, because we, don't, we, the state, we don't want you near her, we want to protect her. Mm -hmm. She has sought our protection, we are giving our protection. 
I always wondered whether that de facto works because you have somebody who is violent, essentially a criminal, beating up his spouse and you know, rendering uh, you know, awful injuries to her. Um, does that work? Uh, it doesn't sound persuasive. And I think in a lot of cases, it isn't persuasive. What do you think? Well, I think that it's no different than any other law that's meant to prevent an act. There's a law against homicide. Murders occur. There's a law against theft. Theft occurs. There is a law against violating a protective order. They occur. It exists to be a deterrent. It doesn't exist to be an absolute 100% shield to the act. So no doubt, you know, we tell our clients, all this is is a piece of paper, right? It is a piece of paper, though, that allows you to call the police and say there's been a violation of the protective order and that person is arrested immediately. There's not an investigation. The police don't come out and take um, uh, statements. I mean, they would take statements, but the idea is it is a crime to violate the protective order. So that in and of itself provides some level of protection. This is Noah. I have the person who I have a protective order. I saw them outside of my house. That's a violation of the protective order. Police will come and arrest them. Just a telephone call would do it. Just a telephone that's call. Pretty, that's good. So, so yeah, to that extent, Suppose they are... Suppose she wants to punish him. Suppose she makes it up. She calls the police with a fictitious complaint. What well, happens then? Well, it, it frankly happens all the time. And, and this is the difficult part of this world, right? It is the boy who cried wolf syndrome that you're talking about, right? Um, there is no doubt in my mind that that happens and um, potentially happens often. Um, but there's also no doubt in my mind that it also is hugely necessary to exist, the, the protective order process to exist to um, protect people because that's necessary as well. Where do you find the balance? If you're a judge, and so, so this is how it works. I, I believe that there's been something which uh, justifies me getting a protective order. I just go to court, I fill out a petition for an order of protection, and I sign it and say, I, under penalty of perjury, this is the truth. And I don't need a lawyer for that. There's no lawyer, there's no hearing, there's no evidence, there's no photographs, there's no recordings, there's no testimony given to a judge. It's just a written statement that says, I say that this happened. And based off of that, Orders are issued by the court, which in my world kicks the other party out of houses. So I'm paying the mortgage on the house. I'm living in the home. I'm about to go through a divorce. And um, my wife goes in or and signs a protective order, says that I beat her up, and sends it into court. And the court grants it. I'm kicked out of the house Am I, until I have a hearing. And if I violate that? Then you'll be arrested. Jail. That's correct. A, a, arrest means jail, no? That's correct. And what happens then? Suppose, suppose my wife calls me on this or calls a, a policeman on this. And I, my, my own view, by the way, is uh, uh, you don't want to give this kind of discretionary decision to a policeman. Uh, we can get into, um, what is it called? Civil, uh, civil, um, the, the governor just uh, vetoed this bill yesterday. Civil, uh, where you take the property. Take the, oh, um, civil. Yeah. Forfeiture. Civil forfeiture, you know? Sure. You don't want to give the policeman that much you know, control of this. Well, anyway, they have it. They have it. On. And de facto, in the scenario you described, they have it. So um, the lady calls the policeman. The policeman accepts what she has to say. He doesn't do any evidence taking. Um, I go to jail. I'm in jail now, right? Because I violated the order. I violated. So the, all, the, all the, the cards are against me. I violated the order. I'm in jail. What happens then? I stay there? Well, you know... Let me back up. There is a basic assumption upon which the courts have to proceed, which is that people who attest under penalty of perjury of telling the truth are telling the truth. So based off of that, and you know, to go back to my last comment about that, that scenario, I don't want to minimize that scenario because that is something that happens a lot. But you know, it is really hard for the judges to make that call. And no judge wants to be the judge that thinks, ah, eh, you know what, this one seems a little bit fishy. I'm not going to grant it sure, this time. because the next thing could happen is really serious injuries. Well, the next thing that happens is they're, you know, um, the judge that let somebody off on the TRO 
and something happens and they end up in the paper and they have to come up for retainment and you know there's there are bad politics <laughs> politics that come into it and perception yeah. of the courts and yeah. so it might it may be that it frankly is good policy to grant most of these TROs because it provides the court with some protection from bad press and we need people to like the courts because respecting the courts is important to the rule of law and at least until this last president we used to be a country based on the rule of law um, not so clear anymore. Not so clear anymore. Oh, you're making me sad, Noah. Um, when I get sad, I need to take a break. Okay. So we can take a one-minute break. When we come back, we're going to talk about exactly what happened with Patrick Shanahan and why, and why that is instructive to us. I'd also like to talk about the, you know, the phenomenon of, uh, of um, uh, violence, domestic violence, family violence, and whether it is increasing and why. Wow. That would be very interesting. We'll come back after this one-minute break. Aloha, this is Scott Perry, and I'm the host of Let's Talk Hawaii at Think Tech Hawaii. In this show, we're going to be speaking in English and Japanese, and I'm going to use my 30 years of experience to help many Japanese viewers improve their English skills, as well as learning many interesting things about Hawaii. You can catch my show every other Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time. See you then. <laughs> Aloha, I'm Tim Apicella. I'm here with Cynthia Sinclair. And this is Trump Week. It's going to appear every Friday at 11 a.m. Between Jay Fidel, Cynthia, and myself, we talk about Trump, the activities, and the news stories for that week as it pertains to the Trump administration. We hope you tune in and watch the fun. Aloha. See you then. Gosh, time flies when you're having fun. Oh, God. Noah, how do you live through this? Do you sleep at night? Uh, not as much as I want, but that's more <laughs> due to the fact that I have an 18, 13-month-old uh, son rather than anything else. So. Yeah, there are, other yeah, there are other factors. So the first question is, uh, as I mentioned before the break, you know, Shanahan interests me because Shanahan himself did not do domestic violence. You know, but there's, as you said earlier, there's a whole thing about the family dynamic um, and uh, the control mechanism within the family, had to, and there had to be some problem, some dysfunction about that. In the two incidents of family violence that happened in Shanahan's family, in the one case, let's see, what was it? I don't know what, which is the sequence. In the one case, yeah, his wife beat him up. Mm -hmm. He was napping or something. He came and slugged him right in the face. I, don't, I think he had to go to the hospital for that. It was, you know, without warning. And as far as he was concerned, without reason, and, and uh, she really let him have it. Um, she must have been very angry about something. Second incident of violence was when his son, I think a teenager, son was, he's, I want to say. definitely a minor because he ended up in, in yeah, juvenile William, detention. William, I think so. it was William Shanahan, oh. um, beat his wife up with a, with a baseball bat. Not only a baseball bat, but I recall it was a $400 baseball bat. It was a serious baseball bat. It was a carbon fiber baseball bat, and he, and he smashed her skull. She required serious medical care after that. So they had a happy family that seemed to express itself through these horrendous, violent incidents. So do you think, maybe there's no answer here, but do you think that maybe this family was dysfunctional? I think that would be a fair conclusion to draw. Um, yeah, I think that the family is dysfunctional. If you have those types of things taking place in, in your family, I think that that's a, probably a pretty good sign that they're dysfunctional. Um, I think that one of the problems with um, our politics today is our, our politicians are expected to be perfect. If you have any sort of blemish, um, now that's something that Trump has improved, I suppose. <laughs> To take it there. everywhere. Um, but I, <laughs> Even you know, <laughs> I don't think it's fair to say if you have anything bad in your past that you can never be a good public servant. And um, certainly redemption should be something that we encourage because if that weren't the fact, then boy, would we lose a lot of good people. It's and part of the human condition. Um, you know, if that was the standard that we held to our leaders, I'm not sure that, um, you know, our past great leaders would have been accepted to be around. Certainly, I'm not sure Churchill was exactly the biggest choir boy around. and. He's said to have done some questionable things about some uh, 
you know, number of different things. So, you know, I, I think part of it is there's this need to sort of hide everything and keep uh, perception of perfection, and that certainly leads to, you know, the shame aspect of it. it leads people to put, throw things under the rug. So was the family dysfunctional? Yes. Did he commit domestic violence? No. Did he perpetuate a culture that, in, within his family, that sought to um, portray that everything was good rather than deal with the issues that were causing these acts to occur? That sure seems like it. Um, one could lead to the logical conclusion that that's why he hid it from his nomination. Right. He, he, and he covered for his son. He lied for his son. He, <laughs> he said, in connection with the baseball bat incident, that it was self-defense. Baseball bat breaking his wife's skull. Yeah, you know, self defense. I, I read on, and he, he apparently later regretted those words and, and said that it was hard to read them and that he shouldn't have said that. So to that extent, you know, he, he took them back. And, you know, as, as a new father, I can't say that, you know, I think you do everything you can do to protect your child. I'm not sure you think of it in the context of child versus wife. But certainly, I know that there's a strong motivation to protect your children. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, when I think of that, I definitely don't think of it in the context that we're talking about. But, you know, I, well, I guess what it suggests, what this whole scenario with him suggests is that if you see domestic violence in a given family, you have to look beyond just the one violent act. There must be something happening, some kind of dynamic in that family. And uh, in a sense, they're all responsible. In a sense, the leader of the household, assuming, you know, it's Shanahan in this case, is, is either he didn't do something he should have done or he did something, did I get this right, he shouldn't have done. <laughs> well, something went wrong there. You know, s frankly, I think it's something that speaks to a larger issue today, which is you need to look at the contextual background of an issue rather than the headline that's there. I mean, we are into sound bites and tweets and 30 second YouTube videos, and it's very easy to draw inappropriate conclusions that are valid based on that short thing. So, you know, who knows what the dynamics of it are, but I think one of the, if there are to be positives taken from it, you know, much like what happened with the Me Too movement and bringing that issue out. You know, um, well, before we went to break, you talked about if there's been an increase in domestic Don't violence. Ask you about that. Okay. Yeah. I think that all of these things bringing it into the news has created an atmosphere where it's become more socially acceptable and less of a stigmatism, stigma, excuse me, to be the victim of domestic violence. Um, sexual, domestic, whatever that nature is. So, um, you know, I, I think a lot of what's happening is we see that there's been a big process of hiding this stuff and, and, and sweeping it under the rug and keeping it within the family. And, you know, there's something to be said for discretion and taking care of issues within the family, but there's something to be said for that creating an atmosphere which perpetuates domestic violence. So, so we've had an increase. You were mentioning during the break, you've had a remarkable increase in domestic incidents of domestic violence here in Hawaii, now, the land of Aloha. Uh, what is that increase, and why is that increase in the last, what, couple of years? So, you know, I, uh, what I'm going to be, uh, I'm just going to read from the, the divorce, um, Hawaii Divorce Manual. And this is back in 2015, so this is, you know, at this point, a couple of years outdated. But between 2008 and 2012, Hawaii experienced an 18% statewide increase in arrests for abuse of household or family member and a 14% statewide increase in petitions for protective orders. Um, the 2014 domestic violence count census revealed that in a single day in Hawaii, 198 people, including 93 children, found refuge in emergency shelters or transitional housing provided by local domestic violence programs, and then 131 hotline calls were answered. So that was single day. Um, now, I don't, I don't know if that's daily or it reads in a single day, but I mean, those numbers are pretty, and then it goes on. Nationally, 36,000 victims found refuge that day. 20,000 hotline calls were an average of 20 people are physically abused by intimate partners every minute. That's what this says. So, um, What's yeah. happening to us? What is going on? You know, a bit above my pay grade. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I think that, um, 
Economics has a lot to do with it. As my time with, the, as I was a public defender in my, my former life on the, on the Big Island, and you know when, when people are worried about money and stressed about finances and um, stressed and, and have all these different pressures, um, that, that creates issues. Now, that's, that is not to suggest that this is a purely socioeconomic determinative issue. It, it sort of is blind, as we've seen with Mr. Shanahan, to um, income levels. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of it is that, that there's may not necessarily be an increase in the amount of domestic violence, but there's been an increase in the reporting of domestic could violence. Be, yeah. my, my guess yeah. is that has something to do with it. Yeah, yeah. And it also could be, this is what I would throw this on the fire, on the fire. Um, that, you know, the family, the whole family institution of family in this country is, um, is breaking down a little bit, and that's what we have. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the roles in the family are beginning to be um, changed. You know, it's not as clear anymore. It used to be fathers were providers, mothers would take care of the home. That's changed, rightfully. Um, where is the balance? Where does that end? How, wh what are people's roles in families anymore? Where does the family come to play? Last year in Hawaii, we had a 20% decrease in the number of marriages in Hawaii. Um, that's that tells significant. You, that tells you something. And it, it also mm, suggests that we have, uh, what do you want to call it, social issues in the state? Or at least social changes, to use your term. But let me ask you one last question, which I think, um, you know, you as a matrimonial lawyer would be well qualified. So they're there, one of them or both of them in front of you, mm -hmm. and they have a history of domestic violence or mm -hmm. some propensity, demonstrated propensity or threat, whatever it may be. Um, and you want to, you know, provide advice. You want to give them a, a moral statement uh, of advice, an ethical mm -hmm. statement of advice. What do you say to them? What do you say to minimize the risk of domestic violence and injury or deaths going forward? <laughs> well, let, let me, that's a lot. It's a big bite to chew on. So let me take the first part. What I tell my clients is that they need to protect themselves, that they shouldn't supplement my opinion of whether or not they need a protective order for their own ability to decide if they need protection. If you're in fear of, your, of violence, you're in fear that you're going to be injured or killed, you need to call the police. Um, but, you know, protective orders are there for protection from domestic violence, and that's what they should be used for. They should not be used to gain an advantage in a paternity case. They should not be used to gain advantage in a divorce case. They should not be used as retribution because you're upset at somebody. Um, they shouldn't be used because you think it's going to get a way to get the person out of the house and get the kids to give in you custody, an advantage custody in a custody right? case. Yeah. Um, and they're used for that. And, and that's unfortunate because I think it, it cheapens the process and it floods the courts and it takes away resources from people that need them. That said, they're, they're really important and people really need them. And we encourage our clients all the time to go get them when they're necessary. And, and, but that's, again, that's, that's something that people need to decide. And there are, there are wonderful organizations like the Domestic Violence Action, Action Center, which is there. Um, you can call a hotline. You can call DVAC and get help from them. You know, so there are resources for people and, you know, encourage people to call them because sometimes it's difficult to recognize if you're in a power and control dynamic. Sometimes it's difficult to recognize that you're in an abusive relationship. You just think that that's how it is. That's how mom and dad were. That's what I experienced when I was a child. You think that that's normal. Um, and, and it's not. You know, violence is never acceptable. But you know, there is a point that you reach when you're going through divorces or paternity actions, when you're really pissed off at people and you heighten your hyperbole. Um, and you can't take those words back very easily. Yeah, so, you know, um, but they, they cause a lot of issues. If you have kids, you can't talk to each other and drop each other off at school. You can't go to the sporting events. You can't go to school events. You can't go to weddings, can't go to birthday parties. No longer a unit. You're no longer even, a, um, you know, you can't co-parent. So the, 
they are necessary for protection, no doubt, but there are consequences from them that flow from them that affect the family unit, even if the family is now mom and dad are separated. You know, that's still a family. It's just a different type of family. So, you know, I, I caution people that, you know, trust yourself, trust your gut, get it if you need it. But if, but if you don't need it and you're just doing it because you think it's going to give you an advantage, there are other things to consider and other ways that it affects your life. And so, mm -hmm. um, and, not, and not, none of, n not to say, not to take away at all, the simple fact that you're using up court resources and judges' time and court officers' time and policemen's time to go serve all of these things and family resources to pay lawyers to fight them that, that could be better used somewhere else. Very so, destructive, very destructive. Uh, but, but very destructive, but if we're talking about the terror, I just really want to be sure to emphasize, because it is important that despite all of those times when they're misused or misappropriated or, or they, they're never going to go away and they shouldn't because they're really important ways and mechanisms of protecting Part people of the human condition. from domestic violence. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Noah. It's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, that's Noah Gibson. He's the managing attorney for uh, Coates, Fry, Tanamoto, and Gibson. Thank you so Thanks, much, Jay. Noah. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it.